And welcome. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Board of Commissioners. The health and safety of our community and staff members at, are at the forefront of our minds as we continue to navigate county business in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Today's meeting is a hybrid board meeting. Some presenters and guests will appear in person and some will appear virtually. For those presenting virtually, please mute your mic when not speaking. When presenting, make sure to unmute your mic and turn on your camera. For all presenters, please state your name for the record before speaking or responding to questions. May I have a motion for the consent agenda? Second. Uh, Commissioner Vega Peterson moves. Commissioner Myron seconds approval of the consent calendar. Marina, do we have any public testimony? Uh, no, Madam Chair. And we just have to take a quick vote on the consent calendar. Okay. Thank you. Yes, please call the vote. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega Peterson? Aye. Vice Chair Stegman? Aye. Thank you. The consent calendar is approved. And thank you for keeping me on track. <laughs> and no, um, Madam Vice Chair, we do not have any public testimony today. Um, I will go on to R1. R1, proclamation pr declaring July 17th through July 23rd, 2022 as pretrial probation parole supervision week in Multnomah County, Oregon. Second. It's been moved by Commissioner Vega Peterson. Uh, Commissioner Myron seconds approval of R1. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning, Vice Chair. Good morning. Commissioner Stegman and Board of County Commissioners. My name is Erica Pruitt and I am the Director of the Department of Community Justice. And I am proud to be here to uh, talk about our board proclamation for pr the presentation of Pretrial Probation and Parole Supervision Week. I just want to start um, first by dedicating our presentation today. As you know, we lost a beloved um, senior manager, Stu Walker, recently. Um, and I would like to dedicate this presentation to him and in his name he loved the work that we did he cared about the work that we did he was passionate about the work that we did he supported each of our staff and really knew talent and knew how to develop people and encourage them to be the best that they could be so I'm dedicating our presentation to Stu so um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. And with me today is our Deputy Director, Denise Pena, mm -hmm. and our Interim Juvenile Services Division Director, Tracy Freeman, and our Adult Services Division Director, Jay Scroggin. And all of us will have a part of this presentation today. Every year, the American Probation and Parole Association, APPA, and community corrections departments across the country and Canada honor thousands of probation, parole, and community supervision professionals who play a vital role in public safety and work to change lives. I am proud to be a part of APPA's executive committee as a past president. I want to underscore the theme of this year's celebration, restoring trust and creating hope. We are experiencing unparalleled times. Community violence is at extreme levels as the criminal justice system works to recalibrate due to the devastating impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. In the midst of it all, I am so proud of how DCJ has shown up for our clients, our community, and each other. It is important to take time to recognize the work that our staff do every day to help individuals change their lives restore their families, and build stronger communities. We are here today to share a glimpse of the excellent work that our staff do. I have, of course, I've already introduced um, our illustrious panel here at the Diaz, and um, we want to take the next couple of minutes to provide you with an overview of the work that we do. I'm going to ask Tracy to begin. Uh, good morning. I'm Tracy Freeman, the Interim Division Director for Juvenile Services. Uh, like Erica, I'm extremely proud of our staff and how we provided services to youth and families during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
As you know, our juvenile custody service specialists, detention managers, nutrition services staff, and many of our support staff maintained operations as usual during the COVID-19 pandemic. They continue to support the health and well-being of youth residing in our detention facility and our assessment and evaluation residential program. We are thankful for your support provided in this year's budget to begin renovating our detention facility and to begin the integration of restorative practices into our facility. We look forward to sharing the progress of this work with you. In addition, our juvenile court counselors have been working hard to help our youth and families with the range of challenges from the impacts of COVID to community violence. They provide a range of support working closely with community partners, and we are excited about the progress we're making with our Transforming Juvenile Probation Initiative and the expansion of the HEAT curriculum for our youth population. So now I'd like to turn it over for Jay to talk about adult services. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, Vice Chair Stegman, uh, Board of Commi Commissioners, hello. I'm Jay Scrogg, and I'm the Division Director with Adult Services. Like Tracy, I am, I am very proud and appreciative of how our staff responded throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Our staff at our RECOG unit continue to come in every day despite the pandemic. They have also been working together with other public safety partners as we focus on pretrial reform. All the buildings that were closed have been now reopened and our community service program is now running again. They are currently piloting running restitution work for our work crews seven days a week, whereas before we were only doing that on the weekends. Staff have worked together to welcome back uh, justice-involved individuals as they come, come in to meet our probation and parole officers. Each has played a key role in the work we do. As an example, our, our office administration staff are the first face that many see when they, when they walk into our buildings, providing them with the important inf information on where to go and who to see. Correction records technicians are the key in keeping track of important records and documents and track the compliance on our case plans. Correctional counselors connect people up to, uh, uh, cor correctional Correctional counselors connect people to the needed resources like housing, uh, medical care, treatment. And our community health specialists work with our Women and Family Services Unit, uh, and they connect just as involved parents to resources and services. In addition, this unit has been able to provide resources such as books and access to summer camps to families impacted by gun violence and uh, who, are served by this, who, who are served within this unit. <laughs> Lastly, our staff have continued to be important partners in the response to community violence. Our gang and family services unit have played an active role in addressing public safety issues and supporting the justice involved individuals and their families who have been impacted by the increase in violence. Our officers are key partners to law enforcement agencies who are working to get guns off the street and continue to play key roles in missions that result in the uh, arrests and confiscation of firearms and drugs. I would now like to hand it over to Denise Pena, who will highlight the work that our director's office is doing. Thank you, Jay. Good morning. I am Denise Pena, and I'm the deputy director for the Department of Community Justice. Like JSD and ASD, several units in the director's office continued to be impacted by the pandemic, yet maintained a level of service and support that kept the department operating. Our human resources team continues to work tirelessly to provide support and information to our staff on COVID-19 cases and operational changes. Our Victim and Survivor Services Unit has been working hard to address the growing needs of our victims and survivors, which have been exasperated by the pandemic. They work hard to connect survivors to resources and financial assistance and serve as advocates when needed. Other key units in the director's office, such as our business application team, business services team, research and planning team, and the volunteer and intern program play instrumental roles in providing information, technology, and additional support. I would like to turn it back over to Erica. Thank you, Denise. Before I read the proclamation, I would like to close with a video created by the County Communications Office, highlighting the work of the community health specialists in our Women and Family Services Unit. The video is used as a part of a presentation of our work at an APPA Institute in an effort to share our work nationally. 
I want to thank the communications office for bringing attention to the work of our department and educating the public about the Department of Community Justice. Our work often flies under the radar. We are proud of the work we do and welcome the opportunity to come back to a board meeting to tell more of our story and to report our outcomes. Um, can we begin the video? I was on the streets, got um, arrested. When I was at VOA treatment, I went from treat the treatment facility itself into a place called the Cooch House. I went from there here. My PO referred me. My PO has saved my life, I feel, like by doing that. I remember her specifically to helping me move my things here, which was awesome. Yeah, they do stuff like that, right? And that's needed, you know, for people like me that actually want to do good and to change their lives. You feel kind of like a fish out of water, right? So like vulnerable, afraid, like you don't have anyone to really talk to, um, kind of like the laws coming down on you as well as people around you. So I know that when I moved here and I had gotten uh, in touch with Leah, things lightened up a little bit, right? So like I actually had somebody to talk to and then someone, to, just the go-to person to get resources from if, if I needed help. You're looking at the person as a whole. You're looking at all of their needs. You're not just unpacking what they need to do in order to complete their supervision. You're also looking at them as a whole. Their family, their children, their health, their social needs, social inclusion, housing, substance use, food security, income, keeping a job, finding the right job, resume help. So it's looking at the person as a whole and understanding that people are more than just who they are when they're on supervision or on their worst days. It's helping them get to their good days. part of being a community health worker or a community health specialist is having shared experiences with the populations that you're working with. So um, as a woman, when I um, joined the county, DCJ, um, I was really excited to work with vulnerable um, women um, because, you know, based on my family, based on my background, I found that I had a lot to, you know, had some similar shared experiences navigating health systems. Community health specialist comes in, they have this set of skills and those skills and that resource navigation, resources that we have in the community, that paired with the caseworker that is the PO and with the law enforcement perspective, that's sort of like a dream team. Because a lot of people, they come into supervision and they're like, oh my gosh, I gotta do all these things to get off paper. But what they don't realize with that pairing, they get so much more. They're within a social service agency, one that carries a lot of weight. You find yourself not only satisfying the requirements of your supervision, but you might find yourself with a job, a house, resources for your children. You might go and get a degree, um, so much more. This program has taught me to save my money, um, get a job, just become extremely stable. Um, I've kept my job for over two, well, almost two years now in March, it'll be two years. I'm a lead at work. Um, and it's just having my community health specialists, you know, they contact me, they get a hold of me. Deb from Southeast Works. It's a community of people that like we need, you know, like people that are serious about their recovery and, and wanting to get their family just together, you know, <laughs> like. It's, it's a real thing, you know, <laughs> like it's not a joke.
getting a turkey for Thanksgiving, you know, things like that. Um, getting Christmas presents for my, my children, which was really awesome this year because uh, we were able, this was the first Christmas we've had together in like five years. And so, and it was awesome. It was the best Christmas I've had in, in about five years. They got their um, Chromebooks, their laptops, a printer. Um, so yeah, it was like, she got her baby dolls. Izzy did. And, um, you did. <laughs> yeah, so it was pretty cool, like, to see their faces light up. It was very rewarding, and I truly believe that the future of law enforcement, the future of parole and probation, would thrive so well with that social service, a community health worker, a community health specialist component everywhere. I'm going to be moving eventually. My goal is to buy my own home. I'm saving up. I'm trying to get my credit better, um, you know, so I just, I have goals and things that I'm working on in order to, you know, make it really awesome for me and my family so we can go and go on vacation together and, you know, just do fun stuff that normal people do, right? Instead of just start the healing and making good memories. So powerful. And I would like to close by again thanking all of the staff that work towards our vision, community safety. Good morning, everyone. I will call to order the July 13, 2022 Housing Authority of Clackamas County Board of Directors meeting. Gary, would you please call the roll? Yes, thank you. Was it Clackamas? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, you know, it, this is how we do it. We're all flexible, and that's why this work is so important to meet the needs of our community, right? Um, so we are so excited um, to be able to present this to you today. And, you know, we have staff that work so hard every day, as you can see in that video, to help us to reach our vision, community safety through positive change. It is an honor to serve as the director of this department, and um, I'm so proud of the work. And I'm so proud of each of the people at this dais, and I thank you for your support of our work. Um, I have a, um, I can, I do not have the proclamation with me. I don't know if you have it in front of you, Commissioner Stakeman. Uh, I've got it right now. Let me pull it up. We have all of our talking points, but I, uh, the proclamation was elusive. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see, I do have it here. Would you like me to read it, or would you like to read it? I've got it. I online. think I oh. might have just gotten it. I think I found <laughs> a friend, um, and here it is. I will read it. All right, I have it. <laughs> So, um, before the Board of County Commissioners for Multnomah County, Oregon, declaring June, July 17th through July 23rd, 2022, as pre-trial probation and parole supervision week in Multnomah County, Oregon, the Multnomah, Multnomah County Board of Commission finds the Department of Community Justice DCJ staff possess a wide variety of skills and experience that helps to meet the vision of the department to community safety through positive change. DCJ staff treats justice-involved adults and youth and their families with dignity while recognizing the right of the public to be safeguarded from criminal activity. DCJ staff supervises over 9,000 adult probationers and parolees annually, processes over 12,000 cases in our recognizance unit, receives over 2,800 youth referrals, serves approximately 979 youth and their families, which includes diversion, informal, and formal supervision and detention, and processes about 1,012 dependency referrals. DCJ staff use best practices when holding justice and address the factors that drive crime. DCJ staff works in partnership with law enforcement and community agencies toward a shared vision of safer community and participates in important reform efforts addressing disparities in our system.
DCJ staff respects victim rights and are dedicated to providing services and protection for survivors. DCJ staff advocates for the restoration of communities harmed by crime and delinquent behavior, and DCJ staff integrates trauma-informed practices and brain science into our work and applies an equity lens to inform our decisions. DCJ staff recognizes that their public safety impact is long-term, helping justice-involved individuals to change their behavior, restore their families, and build stronger and safer communities. The Multnomah County Board of County Commissioners proclaimed July 17th through July 23rd, 2022 is declared pre-trial probation and parole supervision week in Multnomah County, Oregon in honor, recognition, and respect for the dedication and contributions of the county's community justice staff adopted this 21st day, my sister's birthday, of July 2022. Thank you so much. All right, commissioners, we'll start with Commissioner Myron, comments. Thank you. Um, that great way to, to start this day. Um, thank you so much to all of you, Erica and Tracy and um, Jay and uh, Denise. And it is, it always strikes me when we we have this proclamation and this recognition uh, how important it is uh, to recognize the people who, as Erica, you mentioned, too often fly under the radar and provide such important, um, ascent, crucial uh, services to people who are having going through some of the most uh, challenging circumstances imaginable, are some of the most vulnerable people imaginable at the most difficult times in their lives, and help people reconnect, establish um, some sort of footing in the world. And um, I loved in the video the description of just really being able to do their best to thrive and reach their goals, whatever those may be. And, um, you know, this is difficult work during the best of times. And the past few years have certainly not been the best of times. Um, what with a pandemic and the increasing violence that we're seeing and behavioral health crisis and so much. Uh, and yet our staff, um, they show up every day and do this work and help so many people. Again, as mentioned, I think in the video, is um, like they save lives. And so um, when we have the right people doing this work and supporting, people do thrive and they move forward and they meet their goals. And this has lasting impacts and ripple impacts on themselves and their families and their communities. So um, thank you so much to you for all of your leadership, for your presentation here today, and for the amazing teams, the amazing um, staff who do this work. Thank you. Commissioner Jayapal. Thank you, Vice Chair Stegman. Um, and thank you all of you, Erica, Denise, Tracy, and Jay, for bringing this forward. Um, I want to echo what Commissioner Myron said about it being so important that we have this proclamation every year, because as, as you said, Erica, this is work that goes under the radar. And it is so important for the long-term success of the people that we serve and for our community at large. Um, and yes, it's been an incredibly challenging year to do work that was already challenging. So, so much gratitude to everybody in DCJ. Um, the video was amazing. I want to know who got the baby to speak at exactly <laughs> the right time. <laughs> uh, what an amazing comms team we have to pull that off. Um, but, you know, I think the phrase that struck me the most was um, helping everybody to find their good days, right? That we all have bad days. And that's what this work is about, helping people to find their good days and stay with their good days and build on that. Um, I also just really want to appreciate the fact that all of you, every single one of you is a leadership team. Um, you are, what I see is that you are always trying to improve the way that we do this work. And we had a meeting last week about restorative justice and restorative practice and the work that you're doing both internally and externally to embed those practices, which I think is amazing. 
Um, so a lot of appreciation for that because that's hard too. This is a really entrenched system that you are all trying to change. And so um, just really appreciate that work as well. Um, I do have one question. I mean, that, that the, the, the um, community health worker program, amazing. Um, are we able to provide that for, well, not everybody under supervision, I'm assuming, but, but how, how expansive is, is that program? Um, so um, through the American Rescue Plan, we were able to increase our community health specialists, and mm -hmm. we're proud that that was placed into the general fund this year. So we have actually expanded the reach of our community health specialists. They not only work with women in our women and family um, um, family services unit, they also serve um, the um, the youth. And um, Tracy can talk a little bit about some of the work that they do with the youth in our juvenile services division. And also they reach out to POs across our department where there's people that have that need. So our, we knew early on that community health specialists that we needed that classification within DCJ to enhance our work. And um, we are grateful for each of them and the passion and the love that they have for people in our community because they live in our communities. They have lived experience and, um, and they really want to see the people on our caseload succeed. And it's such a nice pairing with us because that's our vision. Tracy, do you want to talk about some of the work they do with the youth? Um, it's been instrumental. Um, our juvenile court counselors are, have been very excited to have the community health specialists working with them because uh, we work a lot with families and there's so many unmet needs and the community health workers are really able to get in there and uh, break down some of the barriers that even as the juvenile court counselors, we still represent a system. So uh, it's, it's been instrumental in helping to move some families. Wonderful. Well, thank you for highlighting that. It just seems like an amazing model. Um, really wonderful. Thank you. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you so much, Vice Chair. Um, thank you all. Thank you, Erica and Jay. And um, Tracy and Denise, it's great to see you in these roles. So it's great to have you guys um, here today, and especially with this occasion of, of really recognizing the work that um, uh, so many of our our folks do with in parole and probation. I was reading the article that was in the Wednesday Wire, and it's you know we have over 500 people who are being honored this week, but really who do this work day in and day out in Multnomah County, and it's just so impactful. Um, the video that we saw today was just, I, I mean, it really um, was a powerful um, example of the way that this work really changes people's lives for the better, the way that it actually is showing the values that we have in Multnomah County. And I, I forget the theme, but it was something like restoring hope and building trust, or, which I think it was like a perfect example of the theme um, for this week and um, was one example, I think, of the broader work that all of our employees who are, who are doing this work really does. And um, the fact that, again, the threads, as um, Commissioner Jayabal said, the, the threads of um, you know restorative justice, the threads of really um, building people's a solid foundation, like a stable foundation, um, to to be able to transition if they have been justice involved, you know, to clients, um, and to have that and to have like a better path forward. Um, the work is important. The work is hard, um, but you know, but I think the way that we're doing it, the work that all of you have done, is um, throughout the department and making sure that. Um, we're building something that's different than something that's right for Multnomah County, and it's going to be something as powerful as we can make it, and that's a, an ongoing process. Um, so I just want to appreciate this, appreciate everyone who is doing this work, and really um, just say how I'm impressed I am, and just can look forward to continuing um, all of the good steps that we're doing and all of the support that I know employees who have gone through so much in the last few years have, um, have shown up to do and will continue to do into the future. Thank you. Well, I, I think my fellow commissioners have said it all, but just let me uh, give my kudos and, and thanks to uh, Denise. Congratulations on your new role. We're so excited to have you. And Erica, as always, your incredible leadership is so important here at the county. And, and Tracy, thank you for, for your important contributions as well. And, and of course, Jay. Uh, you know, most people don't you know, the public doesn't think about the work that you all do. And so having a proclamation like this, we're going to make them think about the work that you do because they should, uh, because there's so much behind the scenes and it's always so difficult to measure something um, that, that people don't see the results of every day. Uh, but the video really highlighted the impact uh, that you all make. And, and at the end of the day, 
It is about relationships. And I think a, a lot of folks, especially during the pandemic, you talked about how challenging uh, that we have become so isolated and even our normal uh, friendships and, and systems of care haven't been available to us. And so that just makes it all the more important uh, that Multnomah County is there and really understands um, the human needs that people have. And it really is about building those friendships, that trust, and, and those families that sometimes people have lost uh, as they go through the criminal justice system. So I, I just want to thank you all so much and all of the 500 folks that, that show up every single day. Uh, you know, it does go back to our motto that, that this work does matter. And uh, it's just such a pleasure and honor uh, to hear the proclamation and have it presented to us today. So thank you for sharing and thank you for your commitment. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's see, I think I'm supposed to ask, I'm so confused here. <laughs> okay, uh, the board clerk will now take a roll call vote. Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? Aye. Vice Chair Stegman? Aye. The proclamation has been approved and adopted. Thank you so much. Yay. Yay. And I, I don't know, Matoya, I mean, I kind of think we need to have a picture. We have a short meeting, you know, today's just kind of a casual summer day. <laughs>R2, resolution approving relinquishment of uh, reversionary interest in 2173 Northeast Clackamas Street. So moved. Second. Commissioner Vega-Peterson moves. Commissioner Myron seconds. Approval of R2. Welcome. Good morning, Vice Chair Stegman, Commissioners. I'm Jed Tompkins, uh, your Assistant County Attorney. With me is Scott Churchill, Manager of Strategic Planning with Facilities. Um, after that presentation, it's not a great day to be R2. Um, <laughs> that was amazing. And uh, this item is a bit more mechanical, maybe. Uh, but here we are, and, and so I'll go through it. <laughs> um, so we are here recommending the, that the board approve the uh, release of a deed restriction on a property that the county transferred to a nonprofit Janus Youth Programs in 1977. This is um, a matter that comes up to the board from time to time. It originates in statute. Uh, there's a process for um, when the county takes in property um, through something like tax foreclosure, the statute organizes a nice efficient process for um, using those properties and leveraging them into public services by uh, transferral, donation to 
nonprofits, um, for uh, things like low income, <coughs> low income housing, social services, or child care services. And that's exactly what happened here. Uh, again, in 1977, the county transferred a tax foreclosed parcel to Janus Youth Programs. They actually did five parcels at that time. This is one of them. Uh, underlying the statutory approach is a recognition that um, properties have a useful life. And so the statute recommends a 20-year time period for um, committing these properties to the public use. We've now exceeded that period of time. Uh, the property has been in use for more than 20 years, and indeed, uh, its life cycle is winding down. It's becoming very expensive to maintain, um, and Janus Youth Programs has assessed the situation and um, found that in, it'd be in their interest to sell the property and reorganize the proceeds into their other existing programs. So uh, proceeds from the sale would go into their general fund and then be allocated to their other programs through their normal budgeting process, much like what the county board does um, with its own budget. And um, so they have come to us asking um, for the release of the deed restriction, which again uh, is required by statute. So when we transferred the property, we included a restriction that said, you will use this for, um, in this case, the low-income housing purpose um, for a minimum of 20 years. And uh, again, at the end of that cycle, um, we will get uh, these nonprofits that have received property from us coming to us. And you may recall, um, we've had a few of these over the years in recent time. Um, and I think that's the sum of it. So uh, if you approved this matter, we would record a quick claim deed, which is a simple statement um, just saying whatever the county's interest in that property is, it is now extinguished. And that would be the act. Scott's here for any questions about the condition of the property. We did take a look at it um, because it's in an interesting location, um, but I think the recommendation of facilities, and I, I don't want to speak to it too far if you have questions about it though, is that in, it was essentially the same assessment Janice made that uh, the property would be expensive to sort of bring back up into a condition where we'd want to continue it for public service use. All right, thank you. Yeah. Commissioner Vega Peterson, questions, comments? Yeah, thank you. Um, I agree. I was looking at the address and I saw it's really smack dab in a, in a very residential area, it seems like. Um, because I was thinking, what other uses could we do, or what you know, like thinking of other property, um, and and it just was, it's just an odd location for when you think of like the count, different other county buildings that we have, and then, so really, Janice Juice at this point is the holder of the property. We just have the requirement with um, with what the use should be before they're able to sell it. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. So if the way it would work under you know the deed restriction itself is if the property ever stopped being used for what we said it had to be used for, it automatically reverts to us. Automatic is uh, kind of a legal fiction because we would have to go to court and <laughs> make the case that kind of thing, right? Of course, we don't have those circumstances here, but that's how it, the, okay. the legal end of it works. Yeah. And so we're just releasing that restriction right. so then they right. can, okay. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I appreciate this. And I know that there was work done to see if there were other you know uses for the county for this and it didn't seem like there was Thank you so much. Yeah. Commissioner Jayapal. Thank you. Yeah, I actually went and visited the property. It is in a very residential area. Um, and it, to my untrained eye, needs a, needs a lot of work. And I guess that's what facilities, to convert it to anything that would be useful to us. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. No questions. Commissioner Myron. Thank you. Um, and I, I feel like I remember this from, uh, maybe it was something different, but the pre-COVID, um, did this come up at That's that exact. point? Okay. Yes, the okay. last time I think we brought something like this to you, it was one of the other five Janus properties, I believe. Oh, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, all right, I remember, I remember that. Um, and so I just, I guess I have just a couple of questions um, and is really the, is it basically the legal, rec like if they fulfill the 20 year, they, it has been used for the purpose that was set forth in the agreement, then that it's, it's automatic. Like are, are there other factors that are 
So it, it's not automatic, and there are also not other factors. Um, it's, it's, and so you're inferring something from the statute, although I've looked at the history, so I, I, I know what they were thinking. Um, the, the idea is they landed at 20 years of, you know, let, let, let's, let's make that the commitment. We'll, we'll um, get that much service out of the property. But recognizing that it, it can't go on, it likely won't, isn't, very few properties can go on forever. We probably aren't picking these properties up at the beginning of their useful life, that kind of thing. And so the statute sort of um, just identifies that at after 20 years, there's no longer an obligation for the local governments to maintain this reversionary interest, this deed restriction. Um, and, and you are allowed to then um, extinguish it, which is you know what we're the process we're following here. So it's not automatic, um, and they don't suggest factors that you should consider. Um, so, and okay, I'm I'm just trying to wrap my mind around. So like even if the like the, I, I guess what I'm trying to understand is if we had other use, if there were other uses for the property, you know that we we have considered, then would why would why would that make a difference if the technical requirements of the statute have been met like so that could we keep it like why would we keep it if it's or why would it be ours well so depending on whether there's different right it, so it wouldn't we do, we are not the owner of the property so we okay. and and the deed restriction doesn't give us any right to claim it back okay okay somebody else has to do something wrong in order for the deed restriction to trigger okay and allow us to claim it back um so what we um did do though is we we would be like any other sort of market participant except being a public entity we're slightly different we can sort of live with the deed restriction whereas out in the market um, this property is not really sellable um, with the restriction on it to any other private party so but if we were interested we could certainly make an offer of purchase that kind of thing and then keep it within whatever use we were identifying um, facilities went out to assess um, the viability of that and is recommending that this isn't the opportunity to do something like that um, does so that we answer? would have to pay for it. We would have to right. purchase. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That was, I guess, yes. my question. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. All right. And uh, that all makes sense. Okay. Thank you for Good. the clarification. Yes. Oh, I yeah. appreciate no, no, your. I, uh, <laughs> it's it's a, right. It can be a little bit cyclical. Yeah. So yeah. No, it, it's a good question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. I don't have any questions. Uh, Marina, was I remiss in uh, asking if we had any public testimony on this item? Oh, no public testimony. Thank you. All right, uh, the board clerk will now take a roll call vote. Commissioner Myron? Aye. Commissioner Jayapal? Aye. Commissioner Vega-Peterson? Aye. Vice Chair Stegman? Aye. The resolution is adopted. Thank you so much, Scott. Thank you, Thank you Jed. R3, informational board briefing on library capital bond program. Welcome to our library team. Morning. Morning. Ow. I have a bad back and then I just knocked my knee and my goodness gracious, feeling my age. Good morning. Oh. Good morning, Vice Chair Stegman, Commissioners. I am Bailey Elke, she, her, Director of Libraries. I have with me today Mike Day, who is the director of our program management office for all of the bond programs, and Kate Vance, who's one of two deputy directors overseeing the bond programs. And we're here to give you our third quarterly update on progress related to these amazing bond projects that um, you all are aware of. So uh, next slide, please. Just a, a quick look at the agenda. We've got a lot to cover, so we'll, I'll try to be brief so we can move things forward, but I think you'll find some interesting new information here today. Next slide, please. And then I would like to read our land acknowledgement. We honor the indigenous people whose traditional and ancestral homelands are now called Multnomah County. 
quote, the Portland metro area rests on traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Ketlamet, Clackamas, bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia River, creating communities and summer encampments to harvest and use the potential, excuse me, plentiful natural resources of the area, end quote, and that comes from the Portland Indian Leaders Roundtable of 2018. We acknowledge the ancestors of this place and recognize that we are here because of the sacrifices forced upon them. In remembering these communities, we honor their legacy, their lives, and their descendants. Next slide, please. This will be very familiar to you, although I would like to sort of just highlight the library's mission because I think it's important when we think about how these new spaces are going to, to um, evolve with, the, with all of these projects. Multnomah County Library's mission is empowering communities to learn and create. We, of course, have our pillars, which are immutable, and on top of those are priorities that we try to ensure are responsive to the existing and current needs of, the, of our community. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Mike Day. Thank you, Bailey, and good morning, Vice Chair Stigman and Commissioners. It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Um, we are on track with our overall bond program sequencing, and really there's no changes or updates to this. But in our project uh, spotlight briefing, Kate will go into more detail and share specifics on the individual, uh, the, the six act active projects that we're involved in. Next slide, please. This gives you kind of the overall bond program kind of snapshot of the, 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 the bond budget. Uh, there is an update to the budget, which includes an adjustment uh, of $1 million of allocating uh, dollars specifically to property adjacent to the Albina site, and Kate will go into more specifics on that as we go through the project presentations. Um, the overall project contingency continues to track well, and the spend down, of course, uh, to meet our tax-exempt bond requirements is tracking with the overall forecasting. Next slide, thank you. So this really just kind of builds on that overall snapshot of how the, the dollars break down in the overall budget. And the only change here, again, is the adjustment to Albina, uh, taking into consideration the land acquisition of the not property adjacent to Albina. Moving on to the next slide. We want to take a, a few minutes just to kind of highlight uh, the diversity, equity, and inclusion, and really our DEI process that has been uh, and continues to be all-encompassing, covering the full gamut from community engagement throughout the design process to our procurement outreach process and how we've engaged uh, with the contracting community as, as a whole. Uh, that's both professional services as well as our general contractors. As we shift now from our planning and design phases on our uh, operations center, which just broke ground earlier this week, and we had a groundbreaking recently as well, in addition to the Chapter 1 projects that will be starting construction uh, in the first and second quarters of next year, you'll see more from us reporting out on COVID diversity and workforce training and hiring. Next slide, please. We do want to just share with you some recent highlights, um, some of which you're very familiar with. And we have had a very strong emphasis, as I mentioned, on our recent procurement efforts for the East County flagship project that truly uh, took the emphasis of COVID certified firms to a whole nother level. And we'll talk about that uh, on later slides. In addition to that, our regional workforce equity agreement uh, which is in partnership with the City of Portland and Metro, uh, is, has been kicked off with all of our CMGC partners as well as uh, the trade partners and subcontractors that will be bidding the projects. Next slide. This next slide gives you a, a kind of a look into that lens of what we'll be doing in the future as far as graphic report outs. We're developing our beta testing of our dashboards, pulling that information now from our enterprise software that we're utilizing, which is B2G, B2G Now and the LCP tracker. 
Uh, one tracks the COVID participation, that's B2G now. The other LCP tracker uh, pulls data in terms of workforce uh, and diversity within the workforce. Moving to the next slide, I wanna highlight um, some great successes that we've had recently, particularly with the operations center in the COVID outreach process and in the bidding and procurement. The targeted participation that Fortis, our CNGC had was 25%, but we exceeded that. Actually, we did really, really well, hitting a current forecast of 35% with the disaggregation that you can see with 18%. MBE participation, 13% women-owned businesses, and 4% emerging small businesses. The other goals uh, outlined below with Holgate, Midland, Albina, and North Portland continue to track through the design and planning process, and we'll have more to report on how that disaggregates in the future as we get closer to the, the guaranteed maximum price and the bidding of that work. At the bottom here, I do wanna highlight our recent procurement with the East County flagship and the recent award of that RFP process to our CMGC partner, Fortis Construction. In their RFP, they've targeted 25% participation, which I think is a conservative target and we're hoping to hit much higher targets. But really the, the highlight here uh, that we wanted to showcase certainly is this commitment that they've made to um, subprime partnerships and mentoring and really building up uh, three key firms to build that capacity for that future CMGC pipeline with COVID firms. Recognizing professional lath and plaster, Viking engineering and construction, and Faison construction as part of the Fortis team. I'm gonna hand it back to Bailey now for a communications and community engagement update. Great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, so just Quickly, some highlights. We've seen a lot more activity recently, given some of the announcements that have been made publicly. A big one was the announcement that the A&E firms for the flagship have been selected. Um, those are uh, the Holst Architects, local uh, firm here that's done a lot of work in Mid and East County. And then of course the international firm, David Ajay Associates, led by what I like to remind us, Sir David Ajay, which is, I don't know if I've ever known a sir. Um, and then, uh, and that's gotten a lot of attention. People are really excited about the prospect. And I think it's a really nice balance of really hyper-local experience and knowledge with that sort of international perspective of design, literally in many countries, many different kinds of communities. So I, I have high hopes for that, for that building. And then of course, as Mike mentioned, we had the groundbreaking for the operations center, which was very exciting. Thank you to those of you who were able to make it out there. It was really nice to, to see the folks who were there to, to celebrate that. And then um, of course, the announcement about the, what we hope will be the site for the flagship, which is, a, which is a, currently a TriMet park and ride. We're in, currently in the um, due diligence with the LOI, the first 120 days to make sure that it's a viable site for this space. So look for more on that coming soon. Next slide, please. And then we continue our commitment to community engagement. Um, it, you can see here a number of different examples of that, including how we're thinking about art, uh, for the Midland Project, um, engaging with local um, neighborhood associations. And uh, we yesterday met for the first time the whole group uh, around community engagement and communications related to the flagship. It was a really exciting meeting. Um, Multnomah, excuse me, Multicultural Collaborative is, is really leading in, in tandem with the people we have working on the PMO who are leading community engagement for us to really make sure that we're walking our talk around those efforts. Next slide, please. Just a couple of highlights. This is, I don't know if any of you had the opportunity to vote. We did another vote as we did with the Holgate Library on the interior um, uh, colors and materials excuse me, materials from Midland. We even had more votes for Midland than we had for Holgate. And if you haven't heard, the option that was selected by the community was option B. <laughs> I hear some support for option B. And that one I believe has a water theme. Am I remembering that correctly? So that's exciting. We're super excited about it and we're really happy to see how engaged the community was in all of that. 
Next slide, please. And then on Elbina and North Portland, the, our Youth Outreach Design Advocates Program wrapped up. Their first session will be beginning again in the fall. That's been really great input from the youth who will be experiencing these spaces coming from those communities, giving us some suggestions on how to make those spaces resonant for them. Next slide, please. And it's back over to Kate. Thank you, Bailey. Good morning, uh, Vice Chair Stegman and Commissioners. Um, this is just our transition slide, so we can go to the next slide. And we're gonna start with the Operations Center. And here you can see the solar or the fo photovoltaic arrays that are instrumental in project tracking towards our net zero energy building. Next slide, please. And as Bailey referenced, we wanna start off with a celebration acknowledgement about our groundbreaking ceremony, which happened on Thursday, July 6th. Um, it was a great moment to mark a transition into construction as a culmination of all the work leading up to this point. And here you can see Bailey and Chair Kafori. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a great photo. <laughs> Next slide, please. Shown here are Friends of the Library Board President Whitney Jacobson, Commissioner Vega Peterson, Bailey Olke, Chair Kafori, and Tracy Massey. Commissioner Jayapal and Commissioner Stegman were also there to sh share their support, so thank you. Um, it was announced at the ceremony that the building will offer a year-round public retail space run by Friends of the Library, which will sell donated books and retired library materials. Next slide, please. And the library has developed a book to commemorate each of the groundbreakings coming up that uh, those attending can sign. It's very exciting. I think it, they said it was, what, 75 pounds? Yeah, it's, it's massive, but it's really it's cool. Like, yeah. uh, it's, a, it's a fun, clever way to, yeah. to acknowledge it. Uh, next slide, please. So our contractor Fortis Construction has mobilized on the site as of July 15th. Work continues on furniture, fixtures, and equipment while we are awaiting the building permit. And RAC, the RAC Mural Committee selected a list of artists to receive proposals on the entry mural. Next slide, please. There are no changes to the overall schedule. The GMP was approved on June 30th, and we've been moving forward with that. Next slide, please. So as a reminder, this is our first GMP that we've pushed forward. Our overall contingency for the project includes an owner and contractor contingency of about 6.3 million. Within the GMP, we have essentially two buckets of contingency. The first is a design and construction and escalation contingency and an, a separate owner controlled contingency. Outside of the GMP, we have 3.375 million of contingency as well. If that's not used, all of the funds will get rolled over to other bond program work. Next slide, please. Turning to Holgate, this is a view of the building from overhead, highlighting a potential layout of the rooftop solar arrays. Next slide, please. The Holgate project has moved into the construction documentation phase and is issuing the GMP design set in mid-August for bidding and negotiation. We expect to bring the GMP before the board this October. We're continuing our focus meetings and working throughout the permit process. Next slide, please. As Bailey referenced earlier, we are engaging the community in design and that has been and maintained as a key aspect and concept throughout all of the projects. This image shows key elements of community feedback and how they are being incorporated into the design. Next slide, please. Sustainability is another key concept. This image highlights numerous sustainability features of the new building. Next slide, please. The Holgate schedule is being monitored closely by the team. Our current city permit review timelines may cause a delay in the end date of the project, and so we are managing that um, and monitoring that carefully. Next slide, please. The team has been working to reconcile the CMGC or contractor third party co and cost third party cost estimators 100% design development estimate. The estimate is currently tracking 2.25% uh, over budget and with the budget balancing, we have budget balancing strategies identified. 
Say that that's five a, times. Fast. A lot of alliteration can get me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide, please. Moving on to Midland. And the project has also moved into the construction document phase, and we're continuing conversations with RAC on the public art. Next slide, please. Here's the site plan with the note showing how community input has influenced the design. We're ensuring that the site is flexible for multiple uses. Next slide, please. This is a view from the southwest looking, oops. One more slide. I'm sorry. Sorry, one more slide. <laughs> oh, there it goes. <laughs> Thank you. This is a view from the southwest looking into the community rooms. All right, oh, hang on, right there. It's, sorry, it's, it's yep. <laughs> That's looking into the community rooms. And now we can go into the next slide, which is schedule. Thank you, Marina. <laughs> Technology lags are, uh, can create some confusion in these circumstances. So there are no major changes to the schedule. As a note, the design team will be issuing a, the GMC, GMP set in mid-August for bidding and negotiations. We anticipate bringing the FAC1 GMP for the board approval in October. All right, next slide, please. The project team is working to align the latest design estimate to the budget. We don't anticipate any challenges. And next slide, please. We are transitioning to the Albina branch. Um, you see an image here of the main entry that will be off of Russell. Next slide, please. The Albina project is finalizing the schematic design phase and is starting the permitting process. As Mike mentioned, the bond program is seeking to purchase the property adjacent to the existing Albina library. Next slide, please. The proposed land acquisition is in its due diligence, fa due diligence phase and it is directly east to the existing Albina library. As you can see here, that's the that teal color. Um, with a brick prep pattern is the proposed purchase site and we have the um, diagonally hashed orange color which is the existing library properties. The location will allow for future growth and flexibility. Short term, this area will be developed into green space that supports the library's vision and community input related to out more outdoor space. During construction, this property will be used for support to support construction activities like additional staging space and to house the job site office during the project. The bond program is allocating $1 million from the premium reserve to allow for the property purchase and development of the site. Next slide, please. So this is a view, uh, is a section of the elevation of changes between Knott Street on the, Al on the historic Albina side and the Russell Street, which is the frontage of the existing ISOM building. Um, and in this image here, you can see the community room is in yellow on the left and the historic library is on the right on that upper tier. Next slide, please. Getting into a little bit more of the floor plans, here you can see the current first floor, which has the administration currently housed in the Lloyd Plaza building and is shared admin and branch staff amenities. It has the lobby and the community room and the terrace. Next slide, please. This is the second floor, sorry, making sure we we moved it along appropriately. This is the second floor addition with collections, branch staff, teen and flex spaces. So this is on the south side of the property. And then the next slide is our north side, which has the historic library is on the top of the drawing. And this will be really the children's and youth area. Next slide, please. We will be restoring the historic building with a, this is a view from the children's area looking toward the new addition, so looking south. Next slide, please. And there's no change to the overall schedule. 
Next slide, please. So our budget is updated to reflect the property acquisition. We did have uh, some overages on our initial SD estimate and we are working closely to bring those back into line with the budget. The team is working with design consult consultants, internal stakeholders, and the contractor to align that budget. Next slide, please. Moving on to North Portland, you can see the historic library on the right mm -hmm. and the addition for the Black Cultural Center or excuse me, um, in the his addition for the Black Cultural Center on the left. Next slides, please. The project has just completed the schematic design phase and is going through a robust reconciliation between scope and budget. This project is just starting to engage with the city on design review and the permitting process. Next slide, please. We really wanted to highlight the Black Cultural Center here. Uh, this slide is very exciting. We're getting a lot of great feedback from the communities on this. And because of that, we've, we're taking this space and we're reaching out to the community to understand how they would like to best use it. And so these are three different proposals based on the feedback we've received and we're working through that process. Next slide, please. The project is moving into the design development phase while finishing the budget reconciliation. Next slide, please. Our schematic design estimate came in over budget and the team is, has worked to identify a path back to budget and is currently in the, implementing that strategy. And with that, I will turn it over to Mike to talk about the East County flagship. Awesome, thank you, Kate. That's a lot to cover. <laughs> Um, as as Bailey mentioned, we are uh, we have a, a site that we are now in our due diligence and have an LOI that's been signed with the county and TriMet. So definitely wanting to celebrate a, a, a big milestone of a lot of work really over the last Couple two years. years. <laughs> um, and this graphic here that you see in front of you uh, really shows you that aerial kind of lens with the Google Earth map of the, the Gresham City Hall uh, max stop directly south of City Hall. So that kind of gives you the, the context. Really, this is uh, truly the kind of that, that center focal piece, the hub, if you will, of what we believe will really uh, become a, a catalyst for how the, the city of Gresham and East County just evolves over time. So we're very excited as we move into with you, uh, moving to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about where we're at. Uh, again, we, we are uh, in that LOI phase. Um, so we haven't actually purchased the property yet, but we're doing our due diligence, going through uh, all the, the layers required of a due diligence process uh, with the city, uh, with TriMet. And that will really be over the next four months uh, and ending in towards the end of October, which will then lead to uh, the negotiations for a purchase and sale agreement. We expect that if everything goes forward as planned, that we would have that purchase and sale agreement sometime in the early first quarter of next year. Our team has onboarded, so the robust RFP process that we shared with you, uh, I think at our last board briefing, now we're looking in the rearview mirror and we have our architect team, we have uh, our contractor on board, our other key consultants, our owner rep is on board, and so we're really just beginning that pre-design process with planning charrettes, uh, the visioning session that we had earlier this week with our Hulse AJ team and all of the key stakeholders along with executive management leadership to really set the stage and to ground the project in terms of the vision and casting that vision into ultimately what we will see in the way of the brick and mortar and, and how that translates into really a, an amazing community project. Our budget, uh, as, as we manage the budget, of course, we, we are always looking forward and trying to forecast ahead. And so in our forecasting, we do want to, with complete transparency, just share that we are forecasting a, a budget overrun from the, the June 2021 budget um, of 14 to $21 million. 
there are some key considerations with that in that and none of this has been finalized and having the value of our team on board early will help us to really go through and peel back the layers and understand from a cost standpoint how we can better align uh, that budget or that budget variance back to our target <coughs> budget. The key pieces to that, that just to kind of give you a snapshot of what those elements are, one is not surprisingly the, the headwinds of inflationary market conditions, the supply chain <coughs> issues, all of those issues are a considerable uh, difference from what we could have predicted a little over a year ago when we set the budget. In addition to that, the overall parking strategy and how do we solve the parking puzzle as we develop this site, this being a, very much a civic node and really the desire and the vision with the transportation development goals of TriMet to not have any surface parking for the future of this development. So it does create some interesting opportunities and challenges with how we solve the parking uh, puzzle. And then just the overall development of this civic node with the indoor outdoor civic space and how that all comes into form as you consider the TriMet stop, the library, and then other future developments. Shifting to the, the DEI front just for a moment and, and again highlighting the excellent work uh, through the RFP process that we gleaned through uh, the, the firm we've selected, Fortis Construction. And, and wanting to highlight and celebrate that commitment that they're bringing to the table with bringing in and mentoring subprime firms uh, as partners through the entire process, not just as subcontractors, but truly engaging with them to, to build that capacity for the future. Uh, an interesting component to that, which uh, is very unique, was uh, their foregoing of their CMGC fee for that portion of work and earmarking that to support uh, and build uh, COBID firms as part of this project. Next slide. This just gives you kind of that picture of kicking things off, really building that collaborative team environment, the, the big room, uh, which is being hosted by Holst, uh, our local architect, and just hitting the ground running, getting everyone together, and just really building that synergy and high functioning team. Next slide. This gives you the kind of the overall snapshot. Nothing's changed here from, from the big picture planning. Uh, still in terms of where we're at today, we're tracking in terms of the overall schedule uh, with an opening or a planned opening in the fall of 2025. So things are moving fast. Lots to do. I'm gonna turn it back to Kate to update, uh, briefly update on the refresh projects. Thanks, Mike. So these are just some of the images from our um, upcoming refresh projects. Next slide, please. Schematic design is underway at Central and we've recent re re recently received the Central Automated Materials Handling or AMH proposal from Linkso. So this is moving forward. Um, there are no changes uh, to the budget at this time. Next slide, please. Our information technology update. Uh, we are in initial discussions around the technology needs for the East County flagship. We are working on automated material handling orders for the operations center and central library, as well as our interim operations center. And we also have received proposals for Holgate and Midland. We're engaging with staff to better understand public commuting, computing needs. And there has been group engagement and understanding of needs around uh, audiovisual audio -visual standards and have been drafted and we're setting those to the projects. Next slide, please. Mike. All right, we're on the home stretch now. Um, kind of as part of our wrap up, the bond program risk mitigation and how we manage that. Um, these are familiar uh, slides to what we've shared in the past. These are the, really the big, highlighting the big issues at the, the overall program management level and how we're monitoring that. Um, a couple of the key pieces to that, of course, are getting ahead 
of as we look at our target value design and the budget alignment with program, really uh, working with closely our contractor, our trade partners, and our design partners to align budget and program. So Kate mentioned a little bit about Albina and North Portland and that process that we're going through, which is bringing that alignment uh, back into vision with our overall budgetary goals. The site acquisition, as I mentioned, uh, and just the LOI due diligence, of course, there's, there's always risk with any property acquisition, so how we're managing that with that all-hands approach over the next four months will be critical. And then uh, just a case study example, and we didn't have a slide for this, but uh, an example of with the inflationary headwinds, with supply chain issues that are very real issues uh, for the contracting community. Uh, we developed a strategy on the Holgate project where we were able to do early procurement of the mass timber. Uh, and in doing that, we were able to lock in the commodity pricing as well as our slot in the fabrication cycle so that we would be able to meet the overall uh, schedule goals. So those are the types of creative, outside the box thinking beyond the traditional uh, process of how we're managing and getting out in front of uh, risks, uh, particularly in this market. Moving to the wrap up and next steps, um, just the uh, ongoing community engagement, that commitment to um, our community, the, the community and that inclusive process in our designs is critical to having successful outcomes and really walking the talk and honoring the vision of, of what the taxpayers paid for uh, and committed to back in November of 2020. Really developing, and, and I, I've seen such a great integration with our library leadership team over the last year of going through the, the forming and storming process of developing a really good communication and a healthy dialogue so that that library leadership intersection with design and construction is uh, very much integrated and not siloed. So that's been an ongoing thing. We continue to refine that. I think that's going really well, but we need to continue to, to press on that. Bond spend down, of course, is in the forefront. The Chapter 1 projects, um, that budget validation process that we talked about, uh, and that rigor that needs to go into uh, making sure that those bond dollars are spent uh, effectively. Uh, we've talked about market conditions, uh, the DEI, uh, and then, of, of course, uh, with the preface project and starting construction, we're moving into a whole new phase where we're going to have other things to share with you, so we're very excited about that. And then lastly, of course, I'm kicking off the East County flagship, which will be called something. Something, not uh, sure. that's just <laughs> It's just what we're calling it today. Um, but kicking off the pre-design phase and uh, really seeing an amazing world-class team that's going to be leading that effort. With that, I will uh, kick it back to you, Bailey, and open it up for yeah, discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Just um, thank you, Mike and Kate, and uh, just a big thanks to Mike's leadership on this. You know, I, this continues to be a huge learning opportunity for me, um, but I continue to be really impressed with some of the thoughtful and creative solutions to some of the anticipated risks and challenges we're facing with these projects, like the, the, the case study Mike shared around Holgate and the mass timber. So it feels good to have such a solid team working on these projects and gives me a lot of confidence in our ability to do what we said we were gonna do. So with that, if there are any questions, we're happy to answer them. Great, thank you so much for the presentation. Commissioner Vega-Peterson. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, thanks so much, Mike and Kate and Bailey, for this update on the project. It felt like we got a little bit of it um, during the budget season, but this was so good to get, um, delve into the details on all these projects. Um, and I have to say, I'm so excited for summer of 2024 when we're gonna have all of the first chapter libraries um, done, and I think that's gonna be really exciting with a lot of opening days um, over that summer. Um, and just, you know, really it just strikes home when you see the schematics like Holgate, like just so much more space and thinking about what the, the current building is. And I know that's gonna be, that's true for a lot of these buildings. Um, and then obviously in the fall of 2025 with the new flagship on, in East County is gonna be exciting. Um, and the announcements about the architects and you know, all the partners in this are just really incredible. Um, I did have a couple of questions. So one was around the flagship and the, the 14 to $21 million premium that we're thinking about right now and how that relate. Well, one, so two questions. One, I'm, I'm curious about um, 
if you could provide a little bit more detail on how we're looking at managing that premium at this point, whether it's going to be contingency or working, I think you mentioned working with some of our um, contractors and the, um, that, but the other piece is how that relates to the parking, you know, what TriMet is asking for around the parking, because um, it, I thought I heard you said that there was going to be no parking at the building. Maybe no that, surface parking. No surface parking. So potentially underground parking? Potentially. I'll let Mike speak to this because okay. that's part, well, that is part of the challenge. Okay, yeah. So I'd love to get some more information on that. Also, because I'm just thinking, you know, part of the reason of having this kind of library there is that so folks in Corbett and Fairview mm -hmm. and a lot of places where they don't have exactly um, transit, really good transit service would be able to access it. Um, better. I mean, I love that it's right on the line, and personally, like for me, like, like that's going to make it really easy to get there. But there's a lot of folks that we we know will be using it or hope will be using it, um, and I'm just curious about, you know, how we're thinking about that. So yeah, if you could provide a little more detail, Mike. Great, and I think you hit the you're spot on as far as hitting the, the key points. Um, those those two being uh, the big drivers. Um, so in terms of the the budget piece first in terms of that range and it is a range right now because we're <laughs> very early in our due diligence process but we've we've actually spent a great deal of time studying a number of options and scenarios and kind of the what ifs in terms of parking and different solutions and options so the two are somewhat woven together on the uh, ultimately when we land the issues around parking and costs we will be coming back with uh, the recommendation to move forward with an adjustment to the budget that really will be addressed out of our bond premium reserve so uh, with the process that we have set up for uh, approvals with any utilization or commitments from that bond premium reserve we will go through that process of approval and then bring that uh, forward to you we expect that we'll uh, hopefully in our next board briefing we'll have much more to share and be in a, in a position where we can give you a much more accurate forecast and a, a picture as to the parking puzzle and how that's being solved. And there are a number of scenarios that are being looked at. The, the structured parking uh, being, being one, and that is very expensive, uh, particularly on a, on a site like this where you're having to, uh, you, you're having to basically dig down and a below grade uh, structured parking along with the geotechnical issues of really any site in Gresham where you have water table issues, all of those considerations with structured parking uh, lead to a much uh, more expensive solution on how we solve the parking puzzle. There are some other ideas that we are um, considering that, um, that are in very early development right now, and that, so those are in study, that those could bring that cost down. And that requires partnership with both TriMed and the city. And so we have meetings actually set up over the next two weeks really to dig in and understand different strategies around parking, some of which could be looking at it from a whole different perspective. So we're trying to bring that creative outside the box thinking into this so that we can really mitigate the, the big premium cost of the structured parking and find other ways to solve that. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does, and I, I appreciate you guys are, you know, I mean, you grasp like kind of the challenges here and what, and, and so I will look forward to um, hearing more about it. And I just, you know, I think we, obviously you guys are really aware of who we're designing it and who we're hoping to use it in and what the needs will be for the, for, for the entire community. Like I said, for East Portland, the MAX is an incredible option, but that's unfortunately not the case for all of our Multnomah County residents. Yeah, and we certainly see this, as, as you have said so many times, this is a regional asset that's serving not just Gresham, but the larger community. And so really in that framework, as you said, you know, we have to consider not just the public transit piece, but how do people uh, get there and just the use of, of cars and where are they gonna park? So it's an important part of how we solve this. Thank you. Commissioner Jayapal. Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you all so much. So much exciting stuff. Um, really, it, you know, the schematics bring it all to life. Being at the groundbreaking for the operations center brought it to life. So it's very, very exciting. Um, I appreciated Commissioner Vega Peterson's questions because I had a couple of the same. And then one follow up on that how does the 14 to 21 million compare to the bond premium reserve, like just for a sense of scale? Sure, I, great question. The, the overall bond premium is 
50.7 million. We've committed five and a half million dollars uh, from that, so we're right at like 45 million that's not earmarked or committed. So that five and a half or 5.6 that is committed was for the seismic piece to North Portland and Albina that we went through in, in March and April. Uh, and then the recent uh, property acquisition that we're in due diligence on for the not property. So we're being very, very careful about um, any uses uh, around those, that bond premium reserve, knowing that with the market conditions, supply chain issues, and you know, the inflationary headwinds that we are up against, which are historically unprecedented, that we really need to reserve that to deal with those greater unforeseen conditions that are, are beyond our control. So, so we're holding that course. Does that kind of give you the overall context? Yeah, it context? does. Exactly. Yep. So if you do the math and yeah. kind of break that down, if we're at 45 and we spend another another 15, not knowing where, where we're going to land, but that brings us down to still having a, a healthy reserve as we move forward with the rest of the projects to deal with other issues uh, and potential inflationary issues that could affect other projects. And, and if I may, I would just add, um, I think acknowledging that after this uh, so solution surfaces, we still still have three other projects, you know, ahead of us. So that's why issues like this one, which are fairly significant around the parking and the and the inflationary expenses, um, it's really important to sort of dig in and really look to our partners for how what might be an opportunity to contribute and and partner on a solution that makes it possible to afford those premiums and maintain the integrity of the budgets for the remaining projects. Yeah, appreciate that. And yes, that was exactly the information I was curious about. And you know, while it does leave a good cushion, it's also a big chunk of that reserve. Yeah. It, it kind of mm -hmm. goes both ways. Yes. So um, appreciate all the careful thinking that's going into bringing that down. Yeah. And then, of course, super excited about uh, the Albina branch and the acquisition of that, that property next door. That's really exciting. Using it as green space in that location, really exciting. Um, thrilled to see the schematics of North Portland, you know, uh, all great stuff. One question about North Portland and the Black Cultural Center. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the community engagement on that, maybe just a little glimpse of the programming that we're envisioning, and then as I'm thinking about other things happening in North and Northeast, I'm thinking about things like the Interstate Firehouse Cultural Center, and are we coordinating with that? So, yeah. some and those are all things that will happen. I think, you know, this came out of conversations with the community during the sort of really early robust community engagement um, process for North Portland. One of the things we heard was, um, as you are aware, that's a, a historic black community for the city of Portland, and this interest in having some ownership of that space. It's something to, to call our own. And at the moment, you know, the vision for that is basically just a space that can be pretty flexible mm -hmm. so that the community can really define how to use that space in a way that is meaningful. But we will also be engaging with the community. We're continuing our community engagement around these spaces and really focusing on the black community to ensure that we're centering their voices and their needs in terms of how that space most reflects that community. So we're not making assumptions about how that space will be used. We're really looking to the community to help us understand what, what would be most meaningful. Great. Um, and again, you know, I mentioned the IFCC is just yep. one cultural resource there. That's a city program. So it, I think it would be great for us to connect with what they're thinking about yep. in that space. As I think well. it's a great suggestion, Commission. And, you know, for, you know, while we're adding space to North Portland, it's not a ton of space. We're mm -hmm. really constrained by that mm -hmm. site. So it won't be, you know, like it's great that IFCC is doing what they're doing and that we will be able to partner. We, as you know, we really seek out those kinds of partnerships to really expand and enrich the programming we're able to yeah, offer. That's yeah. great. And, and sort of one, one last question, similar lines. Partnership with PPS, Jefferson, I mean, you and I talked about it a while back. I, I don't know whether you were ever able to make contact or whether that's still uh, 
kind of desirable? We've had some conversations. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of my team um, attended the, some of the early charrettes with Jefferson and thinking about that space, and they've kept us updated on their plans there. Um, obviously, it's right next door, so we want to be mindful of what's happening there and how we complement each other. I think the reality, f what we've learned over the years is, and I can speak to this from personal experience now that I have a 16-year-old in my house, you know, those, those high school students, um, they have a lot of other stuff they think is really cool <laughs> besides coming to the library. It's really more the tweens that we're, t we're sort of mm. aiming for in terms of, of engaging. So, and that's, you know, those folks aren't at Jeff. So we're, we're still having those conversations and trying to figure out how we make sure that we're um, engaged and partnering. I think there might be some really cool opportunities with PCC right across the street. That whole area, I mean, with the library, PCC, and Jefferson, I think there's some real opportunity. And we do that to a certain degree now. We've done a film festival with PCC, and we'll do other things. But I think with this additional space and all of the energy that's going into those other institutions, I think there's some real opportunity to do some to really amplify each of our missions and services. That's great. Yeah. Exciting. Thank, you. Thank yeah. you. Commissioner Myron. Thank you all. Um, that was a, just a, a really great presentation. I, oh. uh, thank you, Marina. I appreciate all of the um, developments that you shared today, the updates. I, too, love seeing those schematics. It really. That uh, really brings it to life and um, super exciting. Um, I, I appreciate my fellow commissioners' questions. They raised the, the questions that I had and um, really appreciate your, um, your responses. So uh, in general, again, it's always such so wonderful to um, hear about the extent to which you involve community in every aspect of this work. It's like a drumbeat that is playing throughout all of this process. And so um, I just want to thank you again, and that's it. If I may make one final comment. Um, when we announced the architecture firms for the flagship, uh, we got some really interesting responses to that. I, and one that I'd like to share is a friend of mine who called me, who's also a librarian and lives in Portland, and said, oh my gosh, I cannot believe you know, the team you've put together for the flagship. And she started crying and she said, um, you know, Portland's been through a lot. Multnomah County's been through a lot the last couple of years, and a lot of people are starting to lose faith in this community and its future, and that this notion of building a space like that with you know architects, and in particular an international architect, the, the caliber of which we've not seen in our area for a long time, sends a message that we're still here and that we have a really rich and proud future ahead of us. And I thought that was really mm. meaningful to me. And it made me feel really good. And I suspect makes all of you feel really good in your roles as helping us lead this work. Thank you so much. Uh, that's a good segue, uh, Vailey. Thank you so much. If you haven't seen the Portland Monthly article that Vailey sent to me, it, it highlights like Portland is getting world-class international uh, architect to build, I mean, it's so much more than a library. Uh, and you're right, I think that you really put it in perspective, Vailey, about uh, you know the times that we live in, but we are still making investments in our community and we will continue to do that. Um, I also wanted to point out, uh, it's interesting, some of you may or may not know, but when I was a Gresham City Councilor, back in the day, you know, where Gresham City Hall is, which is adjacent to this property, there was always talks about moving City Hall into historic downtown Gresham. But now, I think you've just flip-flopped this, is because now it's like, I, I, if I was a city councilor now, I'd be going, wait a minute, we, you know, we were good where we are. I mean, it's right on light rail, and it's just gonna be this catalytic, um, you know, destination for people to come, and that we really are create. I mean, Vela, you've talked about 
uh, you know, the economic development that has occurred in the Seattle Library. And so just, you know, all of the, the economic development that's going to happen because of the placement of the library uh, is going to be incredible. And true, we've got some challenges, but we've got a great team who uh, is going to get us through this. And so anyway, I'm just, I'm so, so very excited. And thank you uh, to TriMet. Uh, Bailey, I know that there was a lot, a lot, a lot. I know every day, Bailey, when we, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I know that there was a ton of negotiations behind this, and you all make it look easy, but I know that it was not. Uh, but anyway, so I just want to appreciate, uh, and, and I know Matoya left, but that photo, he's the best photographer. Oh my gosh, that photo of uh, you in the chair, amazing. So um, anyway, very, very exciting. Thank you all so much, and let's keep going. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, that concludes our regular board meeting, but before we uh, leave, uh, I'll open it up to the commissioners for any announcements. Commissioner Vega Peterson. Thank you, Vice Chair. I don't have any announcements this week. Commissioner Jaipal. Commissioner Myron. I have a couple of announcements. Yes. Um, so first of all, uh, my, I wanted to talk about a letter that my office has drafted. Um, thank you, huge shout out to Tabitha in my office, but a letter in support of the uh, Minidoka Historic Site Preservation. And I think that um, I, I, hopefully all of our our offices, you received this as well, but we were contacted by the Japanese American Museum of Oregon, the Portland, Portland Japanese American Citizens League, and the Japanese Ancestral Society of Portland with an ask to um, help preserve the uh, Minidoka National Historic Site, uh, which is in Idaho, from nearby development. And uh, for those who don't know, that site is located in Jerome County, Idaho, and it's where the U.S. government incarcerated over 13,000 Japanese Americans from Oregon, Washington, Alaska, and California without due process. Eighty years later, as we are still battling anti-Asian uh, and Pacific Islander hate, and hate crimes against these community members have increased 339% uh, nationwide just last year. We, we cannot afford to be developing over or forgetting this shameful part of our nation's history, but this symbol of what um, the trauma and hardship that uh, our Japanese American community endured and um, made through and is so significant. And so um, we have drafted a letter asking our congressional delegation to step in and uh, really support preservation of this site. And I'm hoping that you will all sign on. So any questions, let me know. We'll get a copy of the letter to you. And, um, and then uh, just quickly, uh, I serve on the state's universal health care task force. It was created under Senate Bill 770 a couple of years ago, 2019. The purpose is to recommend a universal health care system that offers equitable, affordable, comprehensive, high quality, publicly funded health care to all Oregon residents. And I'm really honored to serve on the task force. And we had a large number of community listening sessions, those were just finished, and we are due to submit a final recommendation for Healthcare for All Oregon plan to uh, the legislature in September. So um, this, if, if you have any thoughts about that, recommendations, information's on my website, Oregon Health Authority's website, there's a, a lot out there, but I would love to talk to you about it and anyone who's listening and um, and hear your thoughts or any concerns or questions. Um, and last super quick thing, um, Jenny Nelson, who was the co-founder of Sisters of the Road Cafe, um, passed away recently, and there will be a memorial service for her. Uh, is it Congregation Beth Israel? And it will be next Wednesday from 5 to 7 p.m. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. 
Thank you, Commissioner Myron. I, I wanted to invite folks. Uh, July 27th is National Korean War Veterans Armistice. Armistice Day, and uh, that is in recognition of honoring our Korean War veterans, and as we know, uh, that day did not end uh, the war, but it was a ceasefire. Uh, so I will have the opportunity to speak uh, this Saturday at 10 a.m. along with the Korean uh, Consulate General uh, to honor our Oregon veterans at the Oregon Korean War Memorial in Wilsonville at 10 a.m. So if folks want to come out and pay tribute to our veterans, we would love to see you. All right. And if uh, seeing no other business before the board, the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>